Uh, thank you very much, Pramod, for that kind introduction. Um, as you say, my uh, topic today is the structure of global international society in the coming decade. And I'm going to focus in particular on an idea that I'm calling deep pluralism. Um, pardon my, my sun hat, I'm sitting in my conservatory and it happens to be a sunny day in London, uh, somewhat unexpectedly. Now, deep pluralism is something I've written quite a bit about um, over the last few years. So I'm sticking my neck out here, making a kind of prediction about how I see things going. So what I'm going to do is briefly um, introduce the idea of, of deep pluralism as the structure of global international society that we're heading into and will probably be in for some time. And then I'm going to suggest five uh, uh, basic characteristics that are likely to mark uh, this structure. Uh, and on the basis of that, uh, we can then proceed to, to a Q&A. So the basic idea of deep pluralism is quite simple. Um, it's the notion that wealth and power, but also, and importantly, uh, cultural and political authority are becoming more and more diffuse in international society. We have lived for uh, a long time now in, a, in an international society where wealth and power were quite concentrated, and so were cultural and political authority. Uh, and I think we're moving away from that. Uh, you can see this movement in two different ways. One is that the, uh, the process of modernity um, is spreading ever more widely uh, around uh, the planet. More and more peoples and societies and states are coming to terms with modernity in their own way. Um, this has been going on for a long time, but rather slowly. So those of you who know the history of Japan can see uh, how that happened in, uh, in Japan in the 19th century. Those of you who've been following China um, and some of the, uh, the Northeast Asian countries can see how that's been happening since uh, the later decades uh, of the 20th century. So modernity is, and, and the wealth and power and cultural and political authority that go with it are becoming ever more diffused throughout international society. This is still uneven, but it's a lot less uneven than it was before. And the trend is continuing in that direction. Uh, another way of seeing this, which is related, um, is that this is the, uh, in a sense, the ending period um, of the era of Western domination, which has been going on for the last couple of centuries uh, in the world. Um, it might be a bit of a push to say we're entering into the post-Western era because I don't want to imply that the West is down and out and about to disappear. What I'm saying is uh, in the notion of deep pluralism is that the West will become one of several um, centers of wealth and power and cultural and political authority. And you can see that process going on um, all around, most obviously uh, with the rise of China, but also in other more subtle ways. Um, this means in a sense that if you understand um, international society as having been a core periphery system for uh, the last couple of centuries, uh, then the core is expanding and the periphery is in a sense shrinking. Uh, and perhaps uh, a good symbol of that um, is the G7, um, which initially embodied the idea of a Western dominated core, uh, but now as it were has shifted more towards uh, an outfits like the G20. So you see that the group of, uh, of countries and societies and economies uh, that constitute the core of global society are, are widening. So that's the basic idea that we're moving away from, in a sense, the first round of modernity, which was dominated by the early modernizers, all of whom uh, were well embarked on a modernization process uh, by the late 19th century. Uh, then there was a long gap in which not many other societies succeeded um, in acquiring modernity. And now we're moving into a period where other societies are quite rapidly uh, uh, beginning to do this. So, uh, we're, what we're looking at then is a future in which there will be a, a much more diffuse pattern of wealth and power and cultural and political authority in the system. 
The big question attached to that is whether this will result in a kind of contested global order. Um, those of you familiar with the old realist theories uh, of multipolarity might want to understand it in, in that way, that a multipolar order uh, is going to be more disorderly, more uh, contested, uh, that these new and old centers of wealth and power and cultural and political authority will not get on with each other, not, uh, not respecting each other. Or um, it could be more consensual, where there is, in a sense, an acceptance and respect for difference here, the analogy might be biodiversity. Uh, monoculture is generally thought to be weak and vulnerable in uh, biological terms. So a biologically diverse uh, uh, ecology is generally thought to be more stable and more desirable. Uh, whether that can work uh, in the context, the social and political context of global society um, is the big question before us. And in a sense, that is where the scope for agency lies in, in, in all of this. We have the choice uh, whether we want to make this deep pluralism either uh, more consensual or more contested. I think we are going to get deep pluralism whether we like it or not. And that's, uh, so that's the kind of foundation of my, uh, of my talk here. All right, so with that in hand, uh, let me then proceed to look briefly uh, at five uh, likely characteristics of this deep pluralist um, order. Um, now, the first one, I'm going to stick my neck out a bit because uh, it's not a common view, but I, I'm going to argue that in this uh, deep pluralist order, there will be no superpowers. Right? There will be uh, quite a few great powers um, and lots of regional powers, but there won't be any superpowers. And the logic here is, uh, is fairly straightforward. Uh, I mean, if you like, you can simply see that, you know, once upon a time, back after the Second World War, briefly, we had three superpowers, uh, 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 Britain, um, at the end of the Second World War, Britain and uh, the US and the Soviet Union, and then we had two when Britain faded away. Um, then we had one after the end of the Cold War. Uh, and I think the next position on this sequence is zero. Um, and the argument here is that superpowers are a strange product of the period of Western domination when a, a ridiculously small group of countries dominated the entirety of international society in a, a very big and quite effective way. And that period required that only a small number of countries be in command of the wealth and power of modernity. And as modernity spreads ever more widely and more and more states and peoples acquire that wealth and power, it's going to be more and more difficult for any single country or even a group of countries to acquire the sorts of resources that are necessary to be a superpower. If you think about it, um, when, when Britain was a superpower back in the middle of the 19th century, it was commanding, you know, getting on for half of world manufacturing and trade. Uh, and something similar was true of the United States uh, when uh, it found itself at the end of the Second War World War in a period of great uh, uh, economic and uh, political and military superiority. But how is anybody now, how even China, how is anybody going to acquire nearly half of world uh, production uh, uh, and the world's wealth and power, because everybody's getting uh, more wealth and power, and therefore the scope for the kinds of concentrations of wealth and power needed to support a superpower position is, I think, disappearing. I also think as part of this, that the, the notion uh, of, of anti-hegemony um, is getting stronger. Uh, much of the, the Western period has revolved around hegemonic leaders and hegemonic powers and such like. But as the rest of the world uh, regains its strength, as it were, and acquires the benefits and powers uh, of modernity, that's going to, uh, going to disappear. And it seems to me that the global society that is emerging will not have any particular desire for hegemonic leadership. Indeed, it will probably be very antagonistic um, to hegemonic leadership. It's had enough of that. 
Um, and in, in, this is in a sense what is meant by deep pluralism, uh, that the world is moving towards uh, a distribution of power, which is also accompanied by cultural and uh, political diversity. And I don't think there's anything we can do about this that's just happening. Uh, the question is, is how we handle it. But because it's happening like that, uh, this, I think, means uh, that we will have a world without superpowers. And this will therefore be quite a different world uh, from the one we've been living in for quite some time. And I don't think superpowers are coming back um, anytime soon. So we need to live or learn to live in a world with a more diffuse distribution of wealth and power and cultural and political authority. So, okay, first point. Now, the second point, um, this, as I've suggested, this world is going to contain no superpowers, but a, a number of great powers. They won't all be the same weight, just as they weren't in the 20th century, when countries, uh, if you look around the time of the First World War, there were uh, maybe up to nine great powers, some of which were much, uh, much stronger than others, but all of which were counted as, as great powers. Now, the difficulty, I think, here is that these uh, the likely great powers in this period uh, going forward are going to be rather introverted. Um, and this, of course, raises a difficulty about how this deep pluralist global uh, society is going to be managed. There are two reasons why the likely set of great powers are going to be introverted. Um, the first one is that the old great powers, mainly the Western powers plus Japan, um, are a bit exhausted and fed up with this job. Right? They have not had many thank yous for, uh, for what they've done. Um, they have wasted a lot of lives uh, and treasure. Think of uh, American ventures in the Middle East, et cetera, et cetera. Um, they are the, the American electorate, as indicated by the election of Trump a while back, is really no longer very keen um, on running the world, being the world's policeman uh, and uh, paying the price for, for doing all that. Um, the EU uh, doesn't really have the political capacity and neither does it have the political will uh, to take on that role um, and neither does Japan, right? All of them are under a kind of post-colonial cloud and therefore the legitimacy of their leadership is declining. Um, and whilst the Americans had quite a lot of legitimacy for a while, I think that it has now uh, declined as well, uh, with a lot of help from Donald Trump, uh, who uh, set about dismantling much of the institutional um, uh, and social structure of American power during his period in office. So it seems to me uh, we've got a set of old great powers that are tired and worn out and whose electorates no longer support uh, the idea of spending a lot of money on being uh, global leaders. If we look at the rising great powers, uh, we get a different picture, but with the same outcome, i.e. rather introverted. Um, just take China uh, and India as examples. The interesting thing about China and India is that uh, whilst they wish to be acknowledged as great powers, uh, they also wish to hang on to their status as developing countries. Uh, it somewhat surprises me that China at least has not become embarrassed by this, um, but the Chinese government is very keen to hang on to this, uh, uh, to this standing. And basically that creates an unusual, even unprecedented kind of of great power. Great powers in the past have all been those at the leading edge um, of development. So to have developing countries as great powers produces an, an odd combination. Uh, these countries, they want the rights and the respect and the status due to being great powers, understandably, because they are big powers, uh, but they don't want any of the responsibilities that go with it because they say, we're developing countries, and they say this with quite good reason, I'm not being critical here, uh, I'm just pointing out the fact. They say, they say we're developing countries and our principal obligation is to develop ourselves and that's our contribution and we don't want to get bogged down or entangled um, in running the rest of the world. So this means, and I think this would be true 
um, of other potential developing country great powers like uh, like Brazil, for uh, for example, that they would take a similar line, which means uh, when you add it all up, that all of the great powers, both the old ones and the new ones, are introverted and not really very interested in taking on the responsibilities of running the world. Right? This means we have an under-management problem um, for global international society um, in this emerging deep, uh, deep pluralist system. Okay, that's the second uh, characteristic. The third one um, is that this deep pluralist uh, international society will I think be infused uh, particularly from the global south, uh, but there's a sense in which this is a global issue as well will be infused with a lot of post-colonial resentment. Uh, that resentment has been around for a long time um, and quite a lot of, uh, of societies uh, in the global south, and also China, um, cultivate this. Um, those of you who know anything about China will know that you don't have to be there long before you hear about um, the century of humiliation and how awful it was uh, and, and that line is uh, repeated over and over again, and it affects uh, Chinese policy on a day-to-day -day basis. So the humiliations and debasements and uh, disrespectfulness of colonialism is still very much alive and well in the memories of the global South, um, but it has, it's much less strongly placed uh, in the former colonial powers themselves, who, although they are increasingly acknowledged that not everything they did was, uh, was wonderful, um, have tended as societies to forget about this and to push it, uh, push it into the past. So there's been extensive forgetting and marginalization of, of the, uh, the misdeeds and cruelties and inequalities and humiliations uh, of the colonial period. Now, it seems to me those that post-colonial resentment is being repowered by the fact that many of the societies that experienced it are becoming wealthy and powerful uh, in their own right, and they haven't forgotten. Right? So this resentment is now well-funded um, and well-backed by wealth and power and cultural and political authority. And it shows no sign, uh, it seems to me, of going away. And this is a major problem for how, again, for how deep pluralism is going to be managed. <clears throat> if unaddressed, um, this issue would push, I think, towards uh, the problem that I mentioned of, this, of the system being undermanaged. It would, in a sense, uh, cultivate a contested version of deep pluralism rather than a consensual one. And that seems to me to be one of the dangers that we need to address. And this needs to be addressed uh, from both sides. Right? The, uh, those former colonial powers need to step up a bit and acknowledge more of what they did. Um, but the former colonial powers also need to step up a bit, look forward more than past, and also take some of their own responsibility uh, for the fact that they got colonized and that in many cases uh, there was extensive collaboration with the uh, with the colonial powers this is a painful difficult issue but if it isn't resolved it's going to poison uh, relations within global society and make uh, the management of that society much more difficult the fourth uh, thing i would uh, would point out a fourth kind of characteristic here is that probably um, the influence of non-state actors uh, will decline. I'm thinking particularly here of international non-governmental organizations. Uh, during the period when globalization was fashionable, it was generally thought that such organizations would play an increasing role um, in, uh, in global society. But under deep pluralism, I think there are question marks um, around that. I think firms probably, and corporations will, will probably continue to play a fairly big role, um, as will, as it were, the dark side um, of uh, non-state organizations, the uh, uh, terrorist organizations and criminal organizations, they're not going away anytime soon. Uh, but most of the other NGOs um, have been Western ones. Right? Um, and it, with the decline of, uh, you know, the relative decline of West uh, Western power and influence, 
it seems to me the backing that those organizations have had, which have backed all kinds of things. I mean, human rights, um, uh, women's rights in, uh, in particular, um, those things are going to be much less strongly backed. Most of those organizations being Western were liberal um, and the liberal teleology is also in decline here. So this is something to think about uh, that uh, it, it may be that many of the things that those organizations have pushed for and represented will be less strongly and widely done um, in uh, the pluralist world order. We would not expect authoritarian societies like China uh, and Russia, for example, to generate a lot of non-governmental organizations, but not what they do. It's not in their, uh, not in their basic character to, to do that. So it seems to me one of the possibilities here is that that aspect um, of global society may well go into some decline along with the relative decline of the West. Uh, as I said, the West is not going away, it's not about to disappear, uh, but it is in relative decline. And, and since it has been the main source of this aspect of, of global society, uh, I think we have to look at that quite carefully uh, and think about uh, whether that's going to, as it were, decrease or decline uh, as a feature of, of global society. And the fifth aspect of this, which uh, is dependent on the first um, in many ways, uh, is that uh, a, a pluralist, a, a deeply pluralist uh, global international society is likely to be more regionalized and less globalized than what we have been used to. Um, this is particularly the case if I'm right about there being no superpowers. If I'm wrong, and if the United States and China become in a sense a new uh, Cold War, a new superpower uh, dyad, um, then we will get a similar sort of overlay to the kind that we had in the, in the Cold War and which uh, Ode Weber and I wrote uh, a great deal about uh, nearly 20 years ago now in, the, in that book, uh, Regions and Powers, which some of you may know. Um, but if it is a world of, of great powers, then it is more likely to be a regionalizing world. Um, nobody is going to be doing what the United States has done and intervening everywhere and all and sundry. And what we see emerging between China um, and the United States is not so much a global rivalry, although it has some aspects of that. Um, but it's a rivalry about spheres of influence in, uh, in Asia. Uh, how localized this will remain is, of course, one of the great questions of, of the day. But it seems to me quite probable, worth keeping in mind as a, as a feature to look for, that uh, more and more the, the great powers will be concerned with the areas around them, their, their immediate neighborhoods, uh, rather than being concerned about the planet as a whole. Um, the absence of superpowers and the winding down of the liberal teleology about the world means in a sense, uh, uh, you know, nobody wants to run the world. Uh, nobody wants to control it. Nobody wants to impose their ideology on it. Uh, particularly everybody wants to get along doing their own thing on their own patch. So this points uh, to me at any rate towards uh, more of a regional ordering. Um, the European Union is a, is a good example of that. It's concerned with itself and its immediate periphery, but not with too much uh, far beyond that. Um, you can see the way that China is particularly concerned with its, uh, with its region, and so is India. Uh, and increasingly, I suspect the United States will move in the same direction. Right? So that's the, that's the fifth in a sense, prediction about what the character of this deep plur pluralist order will be. Um, okay, I've only got a couple of minutes left. Um, so to wrap up, I think, uh, as I've suggested already, that there's a very strong momentum behind this, which is basically to do with um, the decline of the West and the spread of modernity. And so I think we're going to get a deep pluralist global order, whether we like it or not. Right? That's basically unstoppable at this, uh, at this point. So the question is, 
what does it look like politically, uh, what's the way of getting the best out of it. I think there are two interesting kind of counter forces to, in a sense, the, the disaggregation or the decentering of the, of the world order that this, uh, that this implies. Um, one is that uh, there still remains, and I think will remain, a widespread interest in maintaining a significant global trading system. Um, it's hard to think of, of any uh, of the major powers who don't want this. Um, or don't need it in, in some respect. So trade, as it has done for a long time, um, will, I think, remain a significant aspect of globalization, although not the all-pervasive, all-swallowing, all-dominating um, aspect. Uh, it seemed to be uh, during the 1990s uh, and uh, the early part of the 21st century. I think the other interesting counterweight to fragmentation, and I'll end on this uh, notice, is, is the idea that um, increasingly uh, as, a, as a species, as humankind, if you want to put it on, on that level, we are facing a number of, uh, of rather severe shared fate problems. Um, and I will mention only climate change. You can think of a variety of others for, your, for yourself. Um, but in relation to climate change, as in the, uh, relation to some, uh, some other uh, things as well, we are all in the same boat. Right? Uh, that boat would seem to be sinking. Um, so uh, unless we can pull together in some way on, it, on issues of this kind, uh, we are going to be collectively in very deep trouble. It's very difficult to predict exactly when um, a suitable sense of crisis will kick in uh, about something like climate change. Could be quite soon, um, could be a decade or two or three down the line, um, but that it's coming seems uh, to me at any rate uh, unarguable and that therefore it will have to be confronted. Uh, and whether we confront it by fighting amongst ourselves for uh, the deteriorating and shrinking habitable areas of the planet, or cooperating with ourselves amongst ourselves to uh, to address uh, issues like climate change and try to do it uh, collectively, since it is a planetary scale issue. Um, that that remains the big question. I hope we take the latter course, and I don't think there's anything in the structure of deep pluralism that stands in the way of that. Um, even if you think back to the Cold War. Um, the United States and the Soviet Union were able to cooperate on some things which were seen as matters of survival. So they cooperated, uh, for example, on, on arms control. Uh, something like climate change stands outside of culture and, and ideological differences. Um, and therefore, at least in principle, it should be uh, easier to cooperate on that. Okay, that's it. Thank you for listening.